It's 1930, and the first FIFA World Cup already has its first controversy. Finalists Argentina and Uruguay can't decide on which country's ball to use. In the end, they make a fair compromise. They'd use Argentina's ball, the Tiento, in the first half, and Uruguay's, the larger, heavier T-model, in the second. By the end of the first half, Argentina is ahead at 2-1, but Uruguay comes back in the second half with their own ball, winning the cup 4-2 and declaring the next day a national holiday. Now, it could be a coincidence or some placebo effect, but for players, the design of a soccer ball, football, makes or breaks a match. Even when the rules don't change, the match ball is short to. You know, a lot of work goes into each new ball's development, and some can be a step or two back in progress. The ball at this year's World Cup in Qatar, Al Rila, may have all the signs of a match ball greatness. But what exactly does that mean? What does it take to make a successful match ball? If you really think about it, there's a hidden benefit to a new design every four years. One that the Al Rila is taking to the next level. Let's skip right past human heads and pig bladders whose irregular shapes made kicking somewhat unpredictable, no matter how many round-headed townsfolk you sacrificed. Those were pretty much the only options up until a certain American chemist, Charles Goodyear, came down from his magical blimp, just kidding, in 1839 to bless the world with vulcanized rubber, combining rubber and sulfur over a hot stove until it becomes rigid. And what's more, it increased the ball's bounceability and kickability. It was easier to kick. So, yeah, the first modern soccer football was made by an American. When the newly formed English Football Association began hashing the rules out in 1863, there was no mention of the ball whatsoever. Not until 1872, when they agreed it must be spherical and 27 to 28 inches. They haven't changed those rules, aside from increasing the weight from 13 to 15 ounces to 14 to 16 ounces in 1937. What has and continues to change drastically is how it's made and what it's made from. This has to be the most recognizable image of a soccer ball. It's called the Telstar, chosen for the 1970 World Cup in Mexico, marking the beginning of Adidas's match ball supplier streak. It was the first ball to pack 32 panels around it. For you geometry fans, that makes it a truncated icosahedron. You can never have a completely panelless. Uh, you're gonna have to have some kind of interlocking structures on here to make the spherical shape. Variations of the same 32 panel ball stuck around for another 36 years, thanks to its stability and predictability. That was until Germany 2006, opting for 14 panels instead, thermally bonded together, not stitched. Senior engineer for the team Geist, Hans-Peter Nuremberg said, after so many years of 32 panels, we decided to try something completely different. By reducing the number of panels and the length of seams, we made it rounder, better balanced, and therefore more accurate. So it's out with the pentagons and in with the peanuts. The Jabulani took it a step further for Joe Bird 2010, dropping to just eight panels. But hold on now, that's where problems can arise, showing just what these panels can do for a ball. See this golf ball? See these little dimples covering it? Take away the dimples, the texture, and you're looking at a bona fide dud. A soccer ball, football, human head, it's all the same. It's down to something called the drag crisis. I'll use my Al Rila to explain this. So this is the ball that's going to be used in the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. And as it's flying through the air, the air will flow over the bottom and the top and the sides of the ball. And a little boundary layer of air gets formed where there's a little region very close to the ball where the air is not actually moving. When the ball is moving really fast, that separation takes place on the back of the ball. As the ball slows down, there's a transition from what we call turbulent flow to laminar flow. And that separation boundary layer happens much higher up, kind of halfway around the ball. So what will happen at that point, this so-called drag crisis, is that the drag will shoot up in value. <laughs> the essence of the drag crisis is due to the surface uh, roughness. And Javalani was simply not rough enough. Players did not like the Jabalani, especially goalkeepers. They're on the front line of the drag crisis. Spanish goalie Ika Casillas compared it to a beach ball. English goalie David James said, there are undoubtedly gonna be some goals scored in this tournament, which in previous tournaments with different balls wouldn't have been scored. It'll allow some people to score extra goals, but leave some goalkeepers looking daft. Surprisingly, the first round of the tournament saw the opposite effect. A collective lack of confidence in the ball saw fewer shots taken. In the first half of their match against Switzerland, Spain had near total possession. 
yet there was a clear reluctance to take shots. The Brazuca, match ball for the next one in Brazil, actually had two fewer panels than the Jabulani, but this time it had extra goosebumps and proof that seam length matters. The longer the seams, the rougher the ball, the more stable its trajectory. It turns out the total seam length on this ball was longer by about 68% than the ball uh, that was used four years earlier, the Jabalani. And if you rub your fingers on the panel of a brazooka, you can feel that surface texturing, that roughness. For the 2018 World Cup in Russia, Adidas paid tribute to an icon once again with the Telstar 18. A step in the right direction, though not quite as revolutionary, it did have a chip in it, not for players, but for fans who were kicking about their own Telstar 18 and want to access you know, weekly content and challenges. Of course, players aren't thinking about that. They're thinking about playing with a ball that can be aerodynamic enough to rely on. You can quantify how aerodynamic a ball is with a drag coefficient, a dimensionless parameter that appears in an object's air resistance. The lower the number, the better it flies. What this is is the drag coefficient for, you'll see the Javalani's, the outlier in yellow, and the the other three balls, the Alreela being the blue one there, uh, the current ball, um, those three are very similar. And then you have this outlier. This high speed area here, this is the turbulent separation. For the Javalani, it slows down. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the flight, this drag coefficient skyrockets. <laughs> so the ball tends to slow a little bit more than what they're used to. As for this year's ball, the Alreela, not much is out of the ordinary. It's back up to 20 panels, thermally bonded for waterproofing, and it plans to be the fastest World Cup ball in history. It's environmentally friendly, the first ball to grace the World Cup with water-based inks and glues. But since environmental groups like Carbon Market Watch estimate 1.6 million tonnes of carbon dioxide to be emitted, instead of the 0.2 million tonnes FIFA and Qatari authorities claim, it sure sounds like a lot of greenwashing and the human rights violations alone. I mean, I, I digress. The Alrila is a good ball. Adidas is counting on it. What, what Adidas does is creates a new ball every four years for the World Cup. And a ball like this sells for about 160 US dollars. So there's a good reason to do this. Every four years, these things come out. People want the new ball. They buy them, they fly off the shelves. The countries who are hosting the World Cup, they get to participate in naming the ball, picking the color scheme, uh, other aspects of the aesthetic properties of the ball. Uh, so they can kind of make it their own ball for their, their own World Cup. The perfect ball doesn't just mean how it feels to World Cup teams, but also to fans and consumers. Adidas saw sales in the second quarter of 2018 rise 20% to more than $6 billion, thanks in large part to their World Cup ball. So I guess that's it then. Even if they do design the perfect ball, whatever that means, we're going to see another one in 2026, 2030, 2034, until the earth dries out and we'll be back to heads and bladders Mad Max style. Now, on a personal note, for me, the perfect ball is a ball you can rely on, right? You know, one way, if you give it a good kick, you'll know where it's gonna go and how long it'll take to get there, no matter the crisis. But you can bet that when you're on the losing side, the ball is the first thing you're gonna blame.